war crimes against medics. As a way to alleviate some of the horrors of combat, social convention and international law make some individuals on the battlefield off limits to deliberate targeting. Very often, however, in the heat of battle, these conventions are ignored, and those who should be off limits are intentionally targeted. Rules and customs of war date back centuries. By the 18th century, the majority of the officer class in an army would be made up of the aristocracy, men of wealth and privilege. These individuals would often attempt to conduct war in a gentlemanly fashion. One of these involved the treatment of enemy officers in battle. The deliberate shooting of officers was considered barbaric and to be avoided. During the American Revolution, while it was never official policy to target officers, the Continental Army did create a unit of sharpshooters who made use of highly accurate long-range rifles, giving them the ability to pick specific targets as opposed to their regular Army counterparts who were armed with much less accurate smoothbore muskets. Under the command of frontiersman Daniel Morgan, these rifles played a decisive role at the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. According to legend, one of his men, Timothy Murphy, under Morgan's orders, deliberately shot and killed British General Simon Fraser. Morgan's other men also targeted other officers and artillerymen, throwing the British advance into confusion, allowing the Continental Army to win the battle. Exactly what did happen is a bit vague, but Fraser and the other officers were definitely targeted by American sharpshooters, giving the Continental Army a decisive advantage. While there was never an official policy to target such individuals, those with the means to do so were more than willing to seek out officers for special attention, no matter how barbaric it may seem. Over the years, restrictions on targets were formalized into official treaties. One of the most prominent of these restrictions is the prohibition of medics and medical personnel as legitimate targets. Some nations, however, not only refused to acknowledge these international guidelines, but also made the deliberate targeting of medics a standard tactic to be used by their armed forces. Two treaties that govern the conduct of soldiers on the battlefield are the Hague Convention and the Geneva Convention. The latter is a series of agreements dating back to 1864, which governed the conduct of soldiers on the battlefield. It was updated in 1906, 1929, and most recently in 1947. Though additions have been made and the exact wording of the treaty has changed over the years, any deliberate attack on a medic or medical personnel, or any unnecessary hindrance in the performance of their duties is considered a war crime and can be prosecuted accordingly. Furthermore, medics are not to be taken as prisoners of war. Should one be captured, he should be returned to friendly lines as soon as practical, and no distinction is to be made between military medical staff and civilians. Temporary auxiliary medical personnel, such as stretcher bearers and those who transported wounded or sick soldiers, are also considered non-combatants, while performing their duties and given the same consideration as designated medics. Medics are allowed to carry weapons for personal protection or to defend the wounded under their care without forfeiting their status as a non-combatant. However, should the medic engage in offensive combat alongside other soldiers, he would forfeit his immunity and be treated like any other soldier. For the most part during World War II, medics did not carry weapons, though there were some exceptions. To ensure these personnel are easily identified to ensure their protected status, many nations would mark them with special symbols, most often a red cross on a white background. This symbol would be displayed on tents, vehicles, as well as helmets and armbands as a quick visual reminder of the special status of the bearer. During World War II, most major powers were signatories of the conventions, including the United States, Great Britain, and Germany. By and large, these nations respected medics and avoided deliberately shooting them while they tended to the wounded. There were some exceptions to this. For example, some SS units would intentionally wound enemy soldiers. When medical aid arrived on the scene to treat the casualty, the SS soldier would fire on the medic, hopefully killing him. There are also incidents of Allied soldiers firing on German medical personnel in clear and deliberate violations of the Hague and Geneva Conventions. While there are many examples of this happening on both sides, for the most part, the non-combatant status of the medics was respected on the Western Front. 
Medics would often tend to soldiers of either side. In one example, a pair of American medics used a French church as an aid station on D-Day, 1944. Wounded soldiers from both sides were given the same treatment. The only restriction was that all patients had to leave their weapons outside. Both American and German soldiers' lives were saved due to their intervention. On the Eastern Front, the situation was entirely different. The Soviet Union did not sign the Geneva Convention, and the Hague Conventions were signed by Russia in 1899 and 1907, with the Soviet Union never confirming its status as signatory, which provided the justification for Nazi mistreatment of both prisoners and medical staff. When in combat, medics would be treated like any other soldier and would be eliminated without hesitation. Should a Soviet medic be captured, he would be sent to a POW camp as any other soldier. Conditions in these camps were horrendous, with the Nazi regime deliberately underfeeding Soviet POWs. The main aims of the German war effort in the Eastern Theater of the War was Lebensraum, or living space for ethnic Germans. As a result, treating the Soviets, be they medic, prisoner, or any other protected class with utter contempt, flew in the face of the Nazi ideology. In response, Soviet soldiers also didn't respect German medics or medical personnel. The war on the Eastern Front was one of untold brutality, with both sides committing atrocities against the other with no regard for international law. Across the globe in the Pacific theater of the war, another military would make the killing of medics a priority. As the United States and other Allied powers conducted their island-hopping campaign, it was soon apparent that the non-combatant status afforded to those in medical fields was not applicable. Although the Empire of Japan did sign the Hague Convention in 1907, and it also signed the Geneva Convention of 1929, but it didn't ratify it, Japanese leadership believed that upholding the treaty would encourage the Americans to bomb Japanese cities, as any captured airmen would be treated as legitimate POWs rather than war criminals, which was what the Japanese considered them to be. As a result, the provisions of the conventions were ignored. While on campaign, many medics found themselves the subject of special attention from their Japanese foes. The Red Cross on a white background that was worn on both helmets and armbands, symbols that in other theaters provided a degree of protection, did little more than single out the wearer as the subject of special attention. Medics and corpsmen would remove these insignia and wear the same uniforms as their comrades, as any feature that distinguished them as medical personnel would only put their lives in unnecessary risk. Additionally, medics and corpsmen in the Pacific Theater would routinely carry weapons and fight alongside their comrades. Though it was a direct violation of the Geneva Convention, there was little point in following its rules, as the enemy didn't respect the convention anyway. Army medic and Medal of Honor recipient Desmond Doss noted the Japanese obsession for attacking medical personnel. In one interview after the war, he stated, quote, to them, the most hated men in our army were the medics. They would let anybody get by just to pick us off. They were taught to kill the medics for the reason that it broke down the morale of the men, because if the medic was gone, they had no one to take care of them. All the medics were armed, except me." End quote. As Doss states, the main reason for targeting medics was to harm American morale. Should a soldier be wounded, it should be the actions of a medic that would be the difference between life and death. Should the medic be killed or otherwise incapacitated, there would be no immediate aid for any other wounded soldier. For centuries, the designation of legitimate and illegitimate targets has been enforced both as a social convention and in formal treaties. In spite of this, many have simply ignored these restrictions in order to gain an advantage on the battlefield. The Rules of War Illegal Acts in Warfare Far from the free-for-all many believe it to be, warfare is actually governed by extensive sets of rules, agreed upon by the international community in order to limit the damage and suffering that inevitably follows a conflict. These rules cover many aspects of war, from the designation of non-combatants, the treatment of medics on the battlefield, and even the types of weapons that can be used, all in an attempt to mitigate the inevitable pain and misery warfare invariably generates. 
While codes of conduct have existed in militaries for centuries, it wasn't until 1863 when the first formal codification of war crimes was established. Known as the Lieber Code, after its author Francis Lieber, the document governed the conduct of Union soldiers during the American Civil War, prohibiting, quote, all wanton violence committed against persons in the invaded country, end quote. Using the code as a guideline, the international community would formally arrange the rules and conduct of war into several treaties, including the Hague Convention and the Geneva Convention, among many others. These treaties outline the treatment of wounded soldiers and prisoners, the protection afforded to civilians and other non-combatants, and even the weapons that can be used. Over the years, these and other treaties would be updated and further codified, expanding the included safeguards. There is, however, no single code of conduct that governs all actions on the battlefield, and not all nations acknowledge the same treaties or even have the same interpretation of the provisions of the treaties they signed. Generally, though, there are guidelines that are followed by the majority of nations on the planet. Invalid targets. The key principle of the laws of war attempt to mitigate suffering and minimize damage. A major part of this is designating those who are off-limits for military operations. Civilians. One of the main points outlined in the various rules of conduct on the battlefield designates legitimate targets from non-combatants. Civilians not actively participating in the conflict are given full protection under international law. Violations of these safeguards include directly attacking civilians, wanton destruction of civilian areas, the deportation of civilians from captured regions, subjecting civilians to unnecessary, dangerous, or experimental medical procedures, and using those in occupied areas for forced labor. In addition to these non-combatants themselves, public buildings are also off-limits for attack. These include, but are not limited to, schools, hospitals, museums, religious buildings, historic sites and monuments, among many others. Power stations, water treatment plants, and other forms of necessary infrastructure are also off-limits for attack. In addition to these, the private property of civilians is also to be respected wherever possible. Looting, plundering, stealing, or any other form of theft is also forbidden. Weapons and other military hardware can be seized during wartime, but other objects that are not military in nature should not be touched. These types of structures are strictly off limits unless their destruction is absolutely necessary for a military objective. For example, a museum is considered a protected location and attacking it a war crime. Though if the building is fortified, storing weapons or in any way contributing to the war effort, it becomes a legitimate target and can be destroyed in the same way as any other military installation. Journalists and reporters in war zones are also to be considered civilians and afforded the same protection as civilians elsewhere, provided they don't take part in any actual fighting or participate in any other way, such as through espionage. Medical personnel and clergy. One of the most extensive series of protections outlined by international law are the ones regarding the safety of medical personnel. Under most treaties, medical personnel performing their duties are to be considered non-combatants and afforded full protection under law. Doctors, nurses, stretcher bearers, and those who transport the wounded are not to be targeted at any time. Likewise, hospitals, aid stations, and any location designated for the treatment of wounded individuals are also given the same protection. These areas, as well as transport vehicles such as helicopters, ambulances, and others should be marked with a distinguishing feature, usually a red cross on a white background, denoting it as being used for medical and not military purposes. Deliberately attacking a vehicle marked in that way is a war crime and can be prosecuted as such. The situation is somewhat more flexible in regard to combat medics. Most treaties and laws stipulate that medics on the battlefield are granted the same protection as any other medical personnel. In most cases, though, they're also permitted to carry weapons. This allows them to protect themselves and their patients from deliberate attacks which are in violation of international law. The exact type of weapons permitted varies from military to military, but generally speaking, those designed for personal use are allowed, such as rifles and pistols, though anything that has a greater destructive potential, such as a rocket launcher or mortar, are not allowed. 
In practice, if a medic is treating a wounded soldier and an enemy combatant attempts to finish off the casualty, the medic is allowed to eliminate this threat while still retaining his status as a non-combatant. Likewise, he's allowed to defend himself and his patients from marauders that may be roaming the battlefield looking for dead and injured soldiers to rob. Should the medic participate in a direct action against the enemy though, such as providing covering fire for his comrades, he would automatically lose his protected status and would be treated the same way as any other soldier. During many conflicts, such as the First and Second World Wars, medics operating on the battlefield did not carry weapons, which helped to avoid confusion in the chaos of a combat environment. If someone is not carrying a weapon, it's highly likely that this individual is a medic, and those who respected international laws would not shoot them. Though not medical personnel, clergy and those designated to tend to the spiritual needs of soldiers are also given similar protection. Other non-combatants As a general rule, only those in uniform capable of participating in the fighting are allowed to be targeted, while those who are incapable of resistance are to be considered non-combatants. These include prisoners or any soldier who lays down his weapons, those who are wounded and unable to resist, those shipwrecked at sea, air crews parachuting to the ground, etc. These are generally known as persons or de combat. While they are in such a vulnerable state, these individuals are not a threat, and attacking them would constitute a war crime. Should conditions permit, they should be taken into custody and treated as prisoners of war, and given all the protection that is given by that. However, should these seemingly vulnerable individuals resist, they would automatically become a legitimate target. For example, if a wounded soldier continues to shoot at the enemy, he is simply another enemy combatant and can be treated as such. In a similar fashion, a parachuting air crew that uses their service weapons to shoot at the enemy as they descend forfeit their protection and can receive return fire. Faking Surrender and Perfidy Faking a surrender or wound in order to deceive the enemy is forbidden. Should a soldier pretend to surrender only then to turn on their enemy is considered a war crime which can be prosecuted as such. This is not only illegal, but it would be frowned upon by the comrades of the individual who attempts it as it also puts their lives into jeopardy. Doing so invalidates surrender as an option, as the survivors of such an act will be less likely to honor any future legitimate attempts to surrender. Perfidy, or leading the enemy into believing that they're under the protection of international law only to break that confidence is strictly banned. An example of this would be encouraging an enemy to surrender only to shoot them once they give up their weapons or breaking the truce once they let their guard down. Uniforms, Espionage, and Symbols Those who participate in combat are granted protection under the Geneva Convention and other treaties, but must wear something to designate themselves as such. A uniform issued by the military is sufficient for this purpose. Likewise, militia, resistance movements, and other informal organizations are also granted the same protections, but these individuals usually lack standard issue uniforms and have to wear some designating symbol to mark themselves as a legitimate combatant. These don't have to be elaborate, even something as simple as a colored armband is sufficient for this purpose. Any combatants who don't wear distinguishing markings are not covered by the laws that provide protection for legitimate soldiers. Spies who operate while wearing civilian clothing or the clothing of the enemy are not considered legitimate combatants and are not afforded the same protections. If captured, any laws regarding the treatment of captured soldiers are not applicable. These individuals are given the right to a fair trial before any punitive actions, but they can be subject to punishments not metered out to most soldiers and normally resulting with the death penalty. Should a soldier remove his uniform to don enemy or civilian clothing, any protection granted to them would be forfeited and the individual would be considered a spy and treated accordingly. This rule also covers the use of other symbols and uniforms that may grant special protections. The use of UN, Red Cross, or other symbols, or that of a neutral nation, to deceive the enemy is also prohibited. Child Soldiers 
One of the most tragic aspects of warfare is the use of the very young on the front lines. Multiple treaties address this issue, banning the use of children as soldiers under any circumstance from participating in warfare, including espionage, acting as couriers or as guides of other military forces. Different treaties limit the age of combatants, with some placing the youngest at 15, while others raise the limit to 18 years of age. Should a child be caught up in the fighting or live in an area under enemy occupation, any punishment, regardless of the crime, cannot include the death penalty. Under the provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention, execution of an individual under the age of 18 at the time of the alleged crime is expressly forbidden. Other Illegal Actions A number of actions that can occur in war are strictly prohibited. These include hostage taking, use of human shields, killing of hostages, torture, the deliberate killing of prisoners, intentionally starving prisoners or others under a military's care, as well as the use of starvation as a weapon against civilian populations. There are also rules relating to any persecution against political, ethnic, religious, or racial groups. The overall intention of international treaties is to minimize the suffering and bloodshed, especially among those that are not taking part in the fighting. Using hostages or human shields deliberately places these protected individuals in harm's way, which can only serve to increase unnecessary carnage. For similar reasons, torture is also prohibited. Corporal punishments for crimes committed are also illegal, as well as collective punishments. There are also very strong provisions against attempted genocide. Throughout the 20th century, many attempts have been made to wipe out groups due to their ethnic, religious, political, or other affiliations. These actions and others do nothing to further legitimate military aims and only increase the experience suffering unnecessarily. Banned Weapons Limiting undue suffering is a key component of the laws regarding warfare. Any weapon that's designed to cause unnecessary misery or distress, or is designed to kill in an inhumane way, is banned for use by international law. Chemical Weapons and Poisons The use of chemical weapons in warfare is banned, as these cause unnecessary suffering. In order to prevent the horrors experienced in the First World War, the use of mustard and chlorine gas is strictly prohibited, as are other lethal chemicals such as VX nerve gas, sarin, and others. Even non-lethal types of gas are banned from use in warfare. Tear gas, commonly used domestically for riot control as an irritant, which causes difficulty breathing and eye irritation but is not lethal, is prohibited in warfare. Poisons are also strictly prohibited, so contaminating food or water supplies is completely banned by international law. Poisoned bullets or other munitions that carry a toxic agent are also forbidden. Biological Agents The use of bacteria, viruses, or other disease-causing agents is prohibited by international law. Not only does this cause unnecessary suffering, which can vary greatly depending on the type of disease employed, but it is difficult, if not impossible, to control. One of the main factors in the rules of warfare is to limit indiscriminate destruction and loss of life. Most weapons have a foreseeable area of effect. Diseases, however, are not nearly as predictable. Contagious diseases can spread rapidly to non-combatants, which can even spread to non-affiliated nations, such as neutral countries bordering the conflict zone. Landmines No other weapon has caused as much controversy than landmines. The main reason for the prohibition of these weapons is their indiscriminate nature. Once buried, they can remain dormant for years, only to be triggered by a hapless individual well after the end of any conflict. Over the decades, multiple treaties have been signed by nations around the world, prohibiting or limiting their use. Some countries place an outright ban on their usage, while some only prohibit anti-personnel mines, which are designed to maim rather than kill. If landmines are deployed, there are multiple restrictions on their usage. They must be kept away from areas traveled by civilians as much as possible, and clearly marked to prevent a non-combatant from stumbling into a minefield by mistake. At the end of the conflict, the mines must either be recovered or destroyed in order to prevent risks to civilians long after the conflict is over. 
Many mines can be equipped with a timer, setting them to detonate after a certain time period in order to avoid remaining in the ground for potentially years. Plastic land mines, which are much harder to detect and remove compared to their metal counterparts, are prohibited from use. Like other landmines, they can remain inactive for many years after the end of a conflict, but are much harder to find and deactivate, making them an even greater threat than the conventional metal ones. International law does not cover the use of remotely detonated mines, so long as they're recovered at the end of the conflict and are not employed in civilian areas. Lasers any weapon that is intended to cause permanent paralysis or injury is banned from warfare. Lasers or any other tool designed to deliberately cause blindness is prohibited from use as a weapon. It's important to note that this ban only applies to lasers designed and intended to cause eye damage in the enemy. Lasers are commonly used by militaries around the world as targeting devices for signaling and communications and other tasks, all of which are legitimate. Should an enemy combatant be blinded by mistake during the use of one of these tools, that is not to be considered a war crime, rather an unfortunate accident. Expanding and exploding bullets. The use of bullets that are designed to either expand or flatten upon impact with the human body are prohibited from use in warfare most commonly in the form of hollow points. These were first banned in the Hague Convention of 1899. Designated originally as dum-dum bullets, these munitions were believed to have caused unnecessary suffering and are not allowed for use on the battlefield. Incidentally, the United States, while a signatory of the Hague Convention, maintains the use of expanding ammunition is legal if there is a, quote, clear showing of military necessity for its use, end quote. In spite of this, the United States did not contest the illegal ruling of this type of ammunition during negotiations in the international courts in 1998 and does not supply such munitions to its soldiers. Similarly, exploding bullets are also banned from use in warfare. As a general rule, any projectile that is designed to explode upon contact with human flesh will cause unnecessary suffering to the victim. This particular rule is somewhat ambiguous, as hand grenades, anti-aircraft shells, and other small, explosive projectiles are commonly in use by most militaries without any objection by the international community. In practice, the crime is the deliberate use of such a device against humans. Employing explosive rounds for anti-vehicle purposes is acceptable, but deliberately targeting humans is a crime under international law. Non-detectable fragments. Explosive shells, mines, or other devices that produce non-detectable fragments are banned for use in warfare. Many anti-personnel devices rely on fragmentation for their effectiveness, usually made out of easily detectable metal particles, which can be picked up on x-ray and other medical devices, allowing doctors to take the appropriate steps to treat a wounded soldier. Some munitions employ the use of glass, plastic, or other material that's difficult to detect by doctors, who often have to resort to finding the fragments manually, causing additional pain and medical complications. These weapons serve no military purpose and only increase the suffering of those unfortunate enough to be affected by such a device. As such, these weapons are prohibited by multiple treaties. Flamethrowers and Flame Weapons Two of the most iconic weapons in use during the 20th century are flamethrowers and napalm, incendiary devices that set fire to everything around them. These weapons are legal to use, though with many restrictions. Incendiary devices are prohibited for use in areas occupied or frequented by civilians. Should such a weapon be employed, every measure must be taken to ensure the fire does not spread into civilian areas. Incendiary weapons can be used against combatants, but only if there are no other ways to eliminate the enemy with less harmful methods. In modern-day conflicts, with much of the fighting taking place in urban areas, this is often difficult, and many militaries simply forego their use altogether. Flamethrowers and napalm can be used to clear foliage and other vegetation, but only if it serves a military purpose and is well away from civilian areas. Cluster Bombs Cluster bombs, also known as cluster munitions, are banned for use by over 100 countries around the world. 
These munitions consist of a single bomb or shell that deploys smaller munitions called bomblets that can spread out over a large area. Cluster bombs are difficult to control and can cover a large area, causing indiscriminate destruction, which is at odds with the intent of international law limiting devastation. Furthermore, these bomblets are unreliable, with estimates placing the failure rate at between 10 to 40 percent. This leaves unexploded ordnance spread over a large area, posing a risk to civilians even years after the conflict. Recently, the United States has agreed to supply Ukraine with cluster munitions, an act that has caused controversy among the international community, including NATO allies such as Germany and the UK, who have fully outlawed their use. There are a myriad of other laws that govern the conduct of soldiers on the battlefield. As the nature of war is constantly evolving, these laws will evolve as well. The nations of the world will be compelled to create a new, updated set of rules on warfare and reinterpret existing statutes in order to protect those caught up in the sheer destruction that combat inevitably leaves behind.